I live on a farm in a rural part of America, a bit away from a deep forest. I don't know if it has a name, but it's always been there. My siblings and I used to play there when we were kids. A few years ago, our mother passed away and dad died when I was 16, so since then, I've always been the man of the house. My siblings, a sister and two brothers, don't live here anymore. I took over the house and lived here alone with my two cats, my dog Jack and a flock of chickens. I've always enjoyed walks in the big forest, and after I got my dog Jack, it's naturally where I go to walk him. There are no trails or hiking paths, just dense forest that occasionally opens up into clearings. Sometimes, you stumble over boulders and the odd ruin of a house or cabin. None of that scares me. I've always been a very rational person. Sure, I've heard strange, seemingly inexplicable sounds in the woods at night. But everything had a reasonable explanation, I told myself. Besides, I always felt safe with Jack by my side. Until that night in the forest that changed my life. It was around three in the morning, and I woke up to a terrible noise outside the house. The chickens had started clucking, and they sounded desperate. There were a hundred of them, and the noise was truly awful to wake up to. Jack went completely crazy, and I quickly got dressed and went out to see what was going on. Almost the moment I left the door, the chickens went silent. Quiet clucking, just like usual, was all I heard. I took out my flashlight and lit up the path in front of me as I walked through the tall grass to the chicken coop. A terrible sight met me. About twenty chickens lay dead, completely torn apart inside the coop. The dark trampled ground was stark white with feathers, and in the night I glimpsed large black patches that I understood were blood. Something cold crawled down my spine. What the hell had done this? I looked around while Jack ran towards the forest, barking loudly. A fox. He must have been a fox. A big one at that, because the hole in the chicken wire at the side of the coop was really large. If I crouched, I could even squeeze through it. Could a fox really be capable of that? I sighed deeply. My shoulders slumped, and I stood there for a while. As the adrenaline faded... The fatigue from the long day working in the fields hit me. I finally decided to gather all the chickens that had escaped through the hole and bring all the survivors into the shed attached to the chicken coop so they wouldn't have to be out there with the dead ones. I called Jack, and after a minute, he came running towards me and sat obediently at my feet. A large plastic water barrel acted as a plug for the hole in the chicken wire so the fox couldn't come back, but I was too exhausted to gather the chicken carcasses. That would have to wait until tomorrow. When I went back to bed, it was with the unpleasant scene of white feathers and dark patches on the ground in the chicken coop in my mind. At eight o'clock the next morning, I went out with Jack by my side to start collecting the dead chickens or rather, their remains. A bit from the chicken coop, I stood still, trying to understand what I was seeing. The chicken coop was empty. All the dead chickens, feathers and all, were gone without a trace. The plastic barrel I had placed in front of the hole during the night was moved and lay tipped over a few feet from the wire. I scratched my head as the realization took shape. No fox could have done this. So what had happened? As I said before, I'm a very rational person and could only accept reasonable, credible explanations. A pack of wolves, one of the wolves, or several, could have tipped over the barrel and let it roll away a few feet to then feast on the prey. But something didn't add up. I have had foxes break in before and take a chicken or two but never this many, and there had never been such a big hole before. 
Foxes usually bite a small hole in the chicken wire and then dig their way in. The whole thing was incomprehensible. An idea began to form. After once again placing the barrel back in its place in front of the hole in the wire, I released four or five hens into the coop. With Jack, I returned to the house and went in without taking my shoes off. I rummaged through a drawer in the living room and first found only a lot of old junk that my siblings had left behind. Old clothes, porcelain figurines, a broken mug. But a bit further down in the middle drawer I found it. A video camera. It could hardly be called modern. I'd guess it was from 2001 or something. But it had an empty memory card and working batteries that I knew would last all night. I had used the camera before on hunts to learn the animal's tracks and movement patterns in the woods, so I also knew it had night vision, which was exactly what I needed to catch the chicken killer on camera. I mounted the camera on a lamp post a bit away from the chicken coop and checked that it had a good overview of the area around and inside the wire. Everything looked good, and I could go back to my daily work in the fields. The day passed and when darkness fell, I turned on the camera and went home, showered, brushed my teeth, and went to bed. I had a hard time falling asleep that night. I kept thinking I would hear the terrible sound of the chickens desperate clucking again. Eventually, I drifted into a dreamless sleep, and when I woke up, it was eight in the morning to my surprise. I jumped up, quickly put on my clothes, skipped my morning coffee, and went straight out to the chicken coop with Jack close by. The four or five hens were walking around unscathed, pecking at the ground, blissfully unaware that they had served as bait during the night. The barrel was still in place against the wire, and up on the post, the camera blinked with a blue light, indicating that the battery was now almost dead. I felt almost disappointed that the animal had obviously not returned, but I took down the camera from its mount and went back home. Jack ran around and did his business, but I couldn't wait to see if I'd caught anything on film. In the living room, I put the memory card in the DVD player and turned on the TV. Expectantly, I pressed play. I first saw myself in close-up in front of the camera. I smiled and waved at the camera before disappearing from view. The chicken coop glowed green in the night vision mode in a slightly eerie way. It always made me think of horror movies. The chickens did, unsurprisingly, nothing interesting, and I started fast-forwarding. They sat and slept for several hours, and slowly but surely, the video lightened. Then I appeared again, and the TV screen went black. Damn, I thought. Maybe better luck next time. The daily chores I occupied myself with for the rest of the day probably don't interest anyone, but in the evening, I attached the camera in the same spot on the lamppost, turned it on, waved for fun, and then went in and went to bed with Jack at my feet. The excitement and nervousness from the night before had disappeared, and I fell asleep quickly but this night I dreamt about the chickens out there. A big black wolf came towards them. It had glowing yellow eyes and big sharp teeth. In the dream, it loomed so large in front of me that I felt like a chicken myself. Slowly but surely, the wolf approached the chicken coop where I was, easily bit through the wire, and lunged at me. Then I woke up. It was half past seven, and I couldn't go back to sleep, so I got up. I hadn't heard any clucking during the night, so I didn't expect anything to have happened at the chicken coop. In peace and quiet, and with my gaze resting out the window towards the foggy forest outside, I made some coffee. When the coffee was ready, I put on my shoes, called Jack, who came towards me with tired steps and went out. I went straight to the chicken coop and saw from a distance that the chickens were still there. Another night had obviously passed without a visit. I started to wonder if the blinking light from the camera was scaring off the animal. 
With the camera in hand, I returned to the house and put the memory card in the DVD player again. Sat on the couch, pressed play, and started fast-forwarding. An hour passed without anything appearing. Two hours was fast-forwarded, then three, but after four hours my heart stopped. Something came into view. I dropped the cup of coffee on the floor. It shattered and coffee flew in all directions. Jack started barking like crazy and ran into the living room to check what was happening. But I just sat there, frozen, in front of the TV. Because what appeared on the screen was a man who came into frame. He had no clothes on, and his bare body was pale and greyish in the night vision. The man looked around and took a few heavy steps towards the chicken coop. He seemed to try to move quietly, without being noticed. Once at the chicken coop, he pressed a few fingers through the wire and grabbed it while pushing his face closer as if he was smelling the chickens. He stood like that, for a long time. At first, I was too scared and disturbed to move, but after 15 minutes had passed and he still hadn't moved, I pulled myself together and started fast-forwarding. Three quarters of the video passed without him moving. Some digital numbers in the bottom of the frame showed the time the video was recorded, and when the clock read 4.34am, the man finally moved. He turned towards the camera in one swift motion, while still keeping his fingers between the wire. His eyes were wide open, and his face was stiff and expressionless. But that wasn't the scary part. I swear the man standing in front of the chicken coop that night looked exactly like myself. In pure shock, unsure of what to do, I stood up, still watching the video where the naked man suddenly turned his face back towards the chicken coop. His movement looked like it was in reverse, because he moved his head with the exact same speed and motion as he had when he turned to face the camera. Then he turned his face back to the camera, and then back to the chicken coop. He kept doing that for quite a while. It really looked like someone was fast forwarding and rewinding, but the remote was in my hand, and the time on the video kept ticking forward. After repeating this unsettling movement about 30 times, he let go of the chicken wire, turned around, and disappeared out of the frame. I didn't understand anything. I just stood there, dumbfounded. Jack barked and barked as if sensing my fear and waiting for me to give him some attention so he could calm down. I shook my head, looked down at him, and patted him gently. He stopped barking, but I was still in shock. Could it have been one of my brothers playing some sick joke? We are quite alike, but it seemed so unlikely and the man had really looked exactly like me, except his eyes, which in the night vision had been ghastly pale, white or beige. When my head cleared somewhat after the initial shock, I quickly decided it was some kind of psychopath lurking around in the woods. The fact that he had looked like me I suppressed for the moment, for my own sake. With this mindset I got pissed off and turned off the TV, that chicken killer would get what was coming to him, I thought, and went to the bedroom. In a locked safe, I had my hunting rifle, and in another cabinet, the ammunition. I took it out and put on my hunting clothes. I didn't exactly know what my plan was. Not necessarily to kill him, but rather try to catch him. I know I could have called the police and asked for help, but at that moment... I wanted to take matters into my own hands. Now, looking back, I just wish I had understood that it was something I couldn't hunt. Something that would hunt me instead. I was so damn naive. The next day, Jack and I headed out into the forest. I packed everything I could possibly need for the hunt. Flashlight, tent and a sleeping bag, food, ammunition the video camera, and some toilet paper. And of course, 
I had my cell phone in case something serious happened. I went straight into the forest in the direction the hole in the chicken wire pointed and Jack ran ahead of me as usual, excited about the upcoming hunt. We walked and walked for what felt like several hours. Jack ran around sniffing and tracking, sometimes several hundred feet ahead. Now and then, he barked, and I was immediately on alert with a rifle under my arm. Every time I was equally disappointed when I realized he had just found some hare or badger. Eventually darkness fell, quickly as it usually does in these parts of America when night approaches. I had hoped to reach a deer stand that my dad and I built when I was 15, just a year before cancer took him. But it was a few miles from the house and Jack and I didn't make it there, so I had to set up my tent. I found a good spot between a couple of large boulders and a big pine tree. Then I made a fire and warmed up some food. While I sat by the fire and ate, Jack lay half outside the tent, resting. But he was on edge, it was noticeable. Every time a branch cracked or an owl hooted among the trees, he twitched and looked around before slowly settling down again. As I sat there, I caught myself listening for something that could be the strange man. It struck me. He could be anywhere. Maybe this was a dumb idea. Would I ever find this mysterious man? And had he really looked exactly like me? Thoughts whirled around in my head as I sat warming myself by the fading fire. Before going to bed, I smothered the last flames with a wet towel. When I fell asleep, Jack lay outside the tent, keeping watch. That night, I had another very strange dream. I dreamt of large black shadows and silhouettes moving back and forth between the trees in a forest. They were tall and almost reached the treetops. In the dream, I panicked at the thought of being discovered by one of the shadows. What would happen if I did? I was laying on the ground and couldn't move a muscle. I started to have a cold sweat. Something was very wrong. I realized why I couldn't move. My legs and arms were not there. Only bloody stumps of what had once been there. I noticed that the black shadows disappeared into the deep dark forest as if they had left me to die. Jack's violent barking outside the tent woke me abruptly. I jumped out of the sleeping bag and started fumbling around in the tent for my rifle. It was loaded with live ammunition, and I crawled out of the tent with the rifle at my shoulder, ready to fire if the danger was near. Pitch darkness met me outside the tent. Only the dark blue sky was discernible between the tree branches and leaves. In the distance, Jack's barking was heard. He must have chased something. I cautiously moved forward in the dark with one hand fumbling in front of me, searching for the large boulder where I had placed the tent. It felt like it would give me some sort of protection, but I couldn't find it. After a few minutes, I had to accept the realization that the boulder was not there. My heartbeat went up another notch. Jack was out there in the forest, chasing something, and things were not as they should be here where I was. After fetching the flashlight from the tent, I set course towards the sound of Jack's barking. With the rifle hanging on my left arm and the flashlight in my right hand, I rushed through the trees. Between the trees I glimpsed the boulders, which seemed to increase in numbers the further I went. Had there been this many boulders here before? The sudden realization that Jack's barking had ceased tore my attention from the boulders. Not a sound was heard except for some crickets and owls hooting far up among the trees. I realized I had no idea where Jack had gone, but what scared me the most was that I hadn't kept track of which direction my tent was. I shone the flashlight in all directions, but I couldn't see the tent anywhere. Relentlessly, I realized how stupid I had been to come out here, and how incredibly stupid it had been of me to just run away from the tent like that. 
I felt so lost and alone standing there in the dark. In desperation, I started calling for Jack, over and over. The echo of my own voice bounced between the trees in a way I didn't recognize, as if the echo came from one direction one second and another direction the next. But otherwise, it was silent. But when I turned to call for Jack in another direction, I froze. About thirty feet away from me stood a man. His pale skin almost glowed in the dark. The man I had recorded outside my chicken coop was still naked and stood completely still, staring at me with wide open eyes. And now I saw that they were neither pale, white, nor beige. The eyes were sickly yellow. Out of pure reflex I raised the rifle and aimed it at the man. Who the fuck are you? And why are you killing my animals? I shouted, and I heard my voice trembling. The man continued to stare, but slowly began to open his mouth. A horrifying second passed while he stood there with his mouth wide open, his gaze fixed on me. And then he screamed, Jack, Jack, come here. The man continued to scream, Jack, Jack, Jack. My hands shook so much I almost couldn't hold the rifle straight. Shut the fuck up or I'll shoot, I screamed in a high-pitched voice. Then something moved in the corner of my eye. I tore my gaze from the man and saw Jack crawling in the tall grass between the trees. His fur was bloody and dirty. His eyes were dark and sad, and he had his ears laid back. Quietly, he crawled up to the pale, naked copy of myself and lay there. Tears welled up in my eyes. What had happened to him? My only friend in life now lay next to an unknown, terrifying man, and he was clearly injured in some way. I squatted down and tried calling him over. Jack. Oh, my dear Jack. Come here, buddy. He lay there with a blank look, staring at me like the man beside him. The man spoke again. He still sounded like me, but this time his voice was a bit deeper and monotone, almost robotic. Jack, come here, buddy, he said. Still squatting, I hastily raised my rifle and aimed it at the man. Whether I was more angry or sad at this point, I can't remember. The emotions mixed and became indistinguishable. With a completely blank mind and desperate strength in my body, I pressed the scope to my eye. And with the man's empty eyes in sight, I was about to pull the trigger. Then I heard Jack bark. I lowered the rifle and saw that he had gotten up and was rushing towards me. But something was wrong. He looked angry. I tried to stand up but lost my balance, stumbled a few steps backwards, and then fell. Something cracked under my back when I landed, and I realized it was the flashlight. Before I could think of anything else, I had Jack over me. In a reflex, I covered my head with my arms, and I felt something sharp press against my forearm. Jack bit me. The survival instinct must have kicked in because I started hitting wildly at my old friend. One of the blows landed on his neck in a way that must have hurt him but it only triggered him more. He roared violently, and I saw that his jaws were covered with something dark and sticky. When I realized it was my own blood from his bite on my forearm, I was filled with a desperate strength. With a kick, I managed to throw him off, and he landed a few feet away. I groped around with my hands, found the rifle, and pulled it up in front of me. Jack stood a bit away from me, he had gotten back on his feet and crouched, ready to jump over me again. Our eyes met for half a second and time froze. His eyes were empty and cold. But what made time stop was that they were no longer brown, as they always had been. They were yellow. I stared at him as time slowed down. Without breaking our eye contact, I pulled the trigger. The shot echoed through the forest and Jack's body was heavy when it hit the ground. I collapsed and looked at him. He had been hit in the throat, 
and blood was pumping out. He tried to breathe, but only a gurgling sound came out, and then his movements ceased. I could barely breathe. I started feeling the throbbing pain in my forearm and noticed that the soaked, torn shirt sleeve was stuck to my arm. And then I noticed tears running down my cheeks. I don't remember much more of what happened that night, but I know that when I looked up at the place where the man, who looked like me, had been standing, he was gone. Instead, there stood a very thin figure that loomed tall, at least ten feet tall. It was hunched over, bent like an old tree, with long, sparse white hair hanging beside its long and drawn-out neck. Its cheeks were narrow and sunken. The creature's skin was dry and looked like wrinkled old paper, and its eyes were sharply yellow. They seemed to glow. After that, I must have turned and run, because the next thing I remember is that I turned around and saw that the creature had been joined by three more similar figures. What struck me this time was that between them stood a couple of dogs. One of them had bloody fur around its neck, its yellow eyes glowed in the dark. I must have wandered among the trees for hours. I never found the tent. When I finally stumbled out onto my yard, I had only one thought in my head. The animals. I went into the chicken coop and slaughtered every single one of them. I carried out the cats and shot them. They could have the animals. Since that night, I don't own any animals. But I miss my beloved Jack terribly. He sits outside my house every night and stares at me with his glowing yellow eyes every time I look out of my bedroom window. Maybe one day, when I can no longer resist, I will let him in. <laughs>